We will now study an example which is very important and very nice also. It is a good source of counterexamples and therefore we, this is called the Cantor set. Okay. So let x equals 0 1 and then you said x1 which is 1 by 3 2 by 3 so you take the interval 0 1 and then you divide it into three parts 1 by 3 and this is 2 by 3 and i want to remove this portion now okay so i'm going to remove it so let me erase it okay so and then i write x1 So I write x1 like this. Now I take the middle, e, divide each one of them into three parts and then this becomes 1 by 9, this is 2 by 9 and then this is 7 by 9, 8 by 9 and then I write x2 is the middle of that. So it's 1 by 9 union 2 by 9 union 7 by 9 8 by 9. These are all disjoint open intervals and then I remove those also. Okay. So now I continue like this. So so we continue like this. so we have read, so this gives you first we had x minus x1 then you had x minus x1 union x2 and so on and now you continue like this uh, continuing like this we define c to be x minus union n equals 1 to infinity xn okay so xn is nothing but the middle third of the previous uh, thing here okay now c is called the Cantor set. So next time what would I do? I would remove a portion here and then I would remove a portion here, I would remove a portion here and I remove a portion here and so on. And now I will go on like this. So I will get something very moth eaten. Everything will be eaten up. There will be some uh, collection of points and you have this. Okay. So first point. Xn is open because it is a disjoint union of open intervals. Anyway, it is union of open intervals. So it is open. And therefore this implies that union of open intervals is also open. So C is closed. measure of xn so what is measure of x1 m1 of x1 is equal to 1 by 3 m2 of x1 is 2 times 1 by 9 ok and so m3 uh, sorry not m2 so it is always m1 of x2 so m1 of x3 will be there will be 4 such intervals 1 by 3 cubed. So, this is equal to 2 into 1 by 3 square, 4 by 1 by 3 cubed. So, in general, inductively, measure of xn is 2 power n minus 1 by 3 power n. And all are disjoint and are unions of disjoint intervals. That is how we computed the, the measure of each of this. Therefore, this implies that the measure of union xn is sigma n equals 1 to infinity 2 power n minus 1 by 3 power n and that is a simple calculation. You will just get 1. So, so 
almost a geometry it's 1 by 3 into a geometric series and then you will get the answer is 1 but this happens to be measure of 0 1 also so from 0 1 I have removed a set of measure 1 so this implies that measure of the Cantor set equal to 0 3 So, C is closed and has measure 0 and therefore this implies C is nowhere else. We already saw that. Okay. 4. Let X belong to C. So, if A B any interval containing X, then for sufficiently large N contains a sub interval of xn because those are of length 1 by 3 power n and this ok. Now endpoints of all such sub intervals are in C. So, no point of C is isolated because every neighborhood you can find points in C again and therefore it is not, so it implies that it is a closed, so closed C is closed. and no isolated points implies C is a perfect set that is a definition of a perfect set and, and this implies C is uncountable. So, this is a theorem from Rudin you can you can check in Rudin's book for instance principles of mathematical analysis that a perfect set in R should always be uncountable. So, C is a closed nowhere dense uncountable set of measure 0. So, we know that countable sets are measure 0. So, the question is are there uncountable sets of measure 0. So, the Cantor set gives you uh, uh, example. So, now we can also show that without using this perfectness we can also show that C uh, is uncountable in the following way. So, you take any x in 0 1 and write its ternary expansion that means x equal to sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a n 3 power minus n. <coughs> How do you compute this a n? You take 0 1 divide it into 3 parts. So, if x comes here then a 1 equals 1. If x comes here a 1 equals 2, uh, so A 1 equals 0 sorry and here it is uh, uh, 1 and here it is A 1 equals 2 because it is 2 by 3 plus something. Here it is 1 by 3 plus something, here it is something less than 1 by 3, so A 1 will be 0. Now if you want to do A 2, so you have to do the same thing and now you divide it into 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine parts. Okay. So then, uh, if it is, you take this here, and then if a one is, if it comes here, then you have a two equal to zero. If it comes here, you have a two equal to one. If it comes here, equals a two equals two, and so on. It repeats here: zero, one, two. 0, 1, 2 and so on. And like this you can continue to uh, write down the ternary expansion of this thing. So this implies, so what does it mean? We have removed all the middle thirds to get C. So C equals set of all x such that uh, if you write x equals sigma a n 3 power minus n, n equals 1 to infinity then a n equals 0 or 2 for all n. Okay, so it doesn't have a, a one equal to one, and now you can. So if you if you now it becomes a simple Cantor diagonalization argument. So you have only two possibilities: a n should be zero or two. So if you make a listing of all the x's in C, if possible, then you uh, look at the first point. If it is zero, you put two. If it's two, you put zero for each number. Then you go to the second point and do like this. So the new number x which you get will be different from every one of the numbers. So this is a Cantor diagonalization argument. How did you prove that zero one? is uh, uncountable. So you do the same thing. You take the binary expansion there and then you have only 0 or 1 are the two possibilities. So if it's 0, you put 1 in that place. If it's 1, you put 0 in that place. You create a new number which is different from all the previous numbers and therefore you cannot exhaust by numbering them uh, in a countable way. That's the same argument here. Instead of 0 and 1, you have 0 and 2 and therefore Cantor said argument implies C is uncountable. Okay, so this is about that example. So now let us see where we have to go. So if you are looking at Rn, then you have three uh, distinguished sets. You have Bn, which is the Borel sigma algebra, and you have Ln, which is the Lebesgue sigma algebra. Then of course you have the power set of R. So the question is are these inclusions strict? So can, can you have a Lebesgue measurable set which is not Borel measurable? Can you have a, a subset of Rn which is not Lebesgue measurable? So in other words, uh, is Ln equal to the power set or not or Bn equal to Ln? Now we will see these again later on but for the moment I will give you an argument which uh, is not complete because I won't be able to prove everything I say but it certainly tells you one of the uses of the Cantor set. Now C is uncountable. and measure 0 implies by completeness every subset of C is Lebesgue measurable. Therefore, cardinality of Lebesgue measurable sets is exactly 2 power c, where c is the cardinality of the content of r, let's say. c is the uncountable, first uncountable number and then, so this is, say, that means uh, there is a one to one correspondence between subsets of r and Lebesgue measurable sets. So there you have that the cardinality is 2 power c. One can show. cardinality of Bn is nothing but C. 
So obviously this is much less than that. So there do exist Borel measurable sets, uh, Lebesgue measurable sets which are not Borel measurable. So that comes from the argument of the Cantor set. But we will also later use what is called the Cantor function and produce an explicit example of a Borel uh, Lebesgue measurable set which is not Borel measurable. Okay, so we will now continue with the properties of the Lebesgue measure next time.